Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? I am ready for rapid fire. All right. I've got one or two that uh, I might work in it. Now I'm, I'm told. Well, I'll just, I'll just hold off on that. Let's get the first question first. We all expect a big breakout season for Tobias Merriweather this year. You know, speaking of optimism, which of these former Irish wide receiver breakouts do you think Merriweather's season will most resemble this year? Equinemia St. Brown, when he went from one catch, eight yards as a freshman, to 58 catches for 961 and nine touchdowns the next year. Will Fuller, who went from six catches and 160 yards as a freshman, to 76 catches for 1,094 yards and 15 touchdowns in year two. Golden Tate, going from six catches for 131 as a freshman to 58 for 1,080 and 10 touchdowns as a sophomore. Or Jeff Samarja, who's a little bit different, but in his first two seasons, he only combined for 24 receptions, 327 yards in his freshman and sophomore seasons combined, but then he blew up the next year as a junior when Charlie Weiss arrived and went 77 catches, 1,249 yards, and 15 touchdowns. So whose breakout do you most expect Tobias's breakout to look like this year? Yeah, so to me, these are kind of lumped in two together. Like Will Fuller and Jeff Samarja, very similar numbers. 66 receptions, 77 yards, just about, you know, 1,100 and 1,200 yards, and each had 15 touchdowns. Like those are kind of, you know, replicas. And then you look at Equinemia St. Brown, 58 for just about 1,000 and nine touchdowns. Um, and then Golden Tate, again, 58, just about 1,000 and 10 touchdowns. So those those groupings are very similar in my opinion. I think – that is going to be very similar to the Golden Tate and Equinemia St. Brown just because of the reception numbers, right? Like I, I don't think that Tobias is going to have the 76, 77 receptions. I think it's going to be closer to the 58 number just because Sam Hartman has more love to go around on the offense. I think he's going to be incorporating a lot of different pieces, um, but I really like kind of where those numbers sit. I, I think that it's going to be very similar to what Golden Tate did. I think he's going to be around 50 to 60 catches, 750 to 1,000 yards, um, and somewhere in between like six to 10 touchdowns. So I think that's right where Tobias Merriweather falls uh, in terms of where his breakout season is going to be. That's I completely agree with that. Like when you look at Golden Tate, who had 58 for 1,080 that's like 18 and a half yards per catch. And St. Brown with 58 catches for 961, that was about 16 and a half yards per catch. And that's what I expect from Tobias Merriweather. I, I don't expect him to be like 58 catches, especially coming from what he came from, would still be a pretty healthy season. And really, when you consider what Notre Dame receivers have done on the last few years with Michael Mayer being on the field, it would still be a pretty healthy season. But I don't expect him to be the big volume guy. I expect, you know, his, just like you said, I expect his receptions to be a little bit more moderate. But, you know, again, Sam Hartman stretched the field. Tobias Merriweather, you know, big lanky body with some speed and agility. I expect him to be able to go get some balls downfield. And I expect him to be a bit more of a big play type guy. So I, I agree with what you're saying. Somewhere in that mix, St. Brown, Golden Tate is what I think it will be as well. What I, just saw, I just saw a, a Tobias is going for 100, 2,025. I mean, that's – if he does that, that's – that's. Not, I know there's some joking in there, but on it like Ooh. that, <laughs> you might as well just hand over the award to him at that point if he's going to have that kind of season. Yeah, and I just saw James saying, honestly, he's a blend of Shark and Fuller, has size and speed, Shark-Fuller hybrid. That's That's pretty good – Pretty good comparison. I like that. You know, again, like I, I like, you know, I like what Samarja was able to do, you know, just with like, especially for as long and lanky as he was, he had pretty good body control and he had, you know, really good agility, the ability to, you know, make some cuts, you know, like with quick twitch that a lot of guys that size don't have. And I think that Tobias definitely has some of that as well. So I can kind of see that hybrid that you're talking about. Yeah, Mr. 2.0 brought up a good point and, and why I think that, you know, he's not going to be that reception guy. Like, I think someone like Colsey is going to have a really good season this year. Mm -hmm. Just another just another big frame that Sam Hartman can take advantage of and, and, and manipulate, you know, 
manipulate defenses with essentially. So the love is definitely going to go around. Um, but I think Tobias, again, I think he ends up north of 50, north of 50 receptions, north of 750 yards and north of seven touchdowns. I think that's yeah. a good baseline for him. I mean, between Tyree and Thomas, those, you know, like, and you mentioned Colsey as well, but like Tyree and Thomas in, in that mix as well, like more volume receptions, I think. So, you know, between like the different kind of bodies they have and playing inside and outside and all that kind of stuff. Excuse me. Jesse, do you have some whiteboard for us today? I do. All of this Tobias Merriweather conversation has got me thinking about nice. what can Tobias Merriweather do in terms nice. of route running uh, to be successful this season. So, you know, I, I, I'm just here for the fans and <laughs> they have been disappointed in me recently. So it's time to uh, fulfill the need, the desire. It is whiteboard time. So I'm going to try to keep it nice and simple today. Hard for me to do. Not really concise with words, but we'll try to do it <laughs> to the best of our ability. Um, all right. So first of all, I think what has to be understood is that Tobias Weather, Mayor Weather is going to be your Z wide receiver, right? So what does that mean in terms of his placement on the field? Well, usually the Z wide receiver is lined up near the tight end or the tight end side of the ball, right? And so that not that that limits you, but we know Notre Dame likes to run an offense with tight ends. And I don't think that's going to change with Jared Parker being a guy who's coached tight ends before. Knowing what Marcus Freeman wants to accomplish in the run game, having a tight end on the field is only going to help, you know, those things. So that's the first thing to understand is that Merriweather has got to be near or on the same side as the tight end majority of the time. That's what it means yep. to be a Z wide receiver. So then you start looking at, okay, what can he do out of, this is just a um, 11 personnel, one tight end, one running back and three wide receivers. So we have uh, two wide balls in the middle of the field, two wide receivers to the right, uh, running back to the right. And then we have a fullback and the Z wide receiver to the left side. Again, Merriweather's got to be with the tight end being the Z wide receiver. So I think there's there's two basic things that come up in, in route running. Are we going to be running a man route or are we going to be you know running a um, a zone route? And that's what the, the advantage of having someone like Sam Hartman is going to be is he is going to very early identify pre-snap. Are they in zone? Are they in man and getting Tobias Merriweather and everyone else into the route, right, right, right route concepts, depending on man or sure zone? That. Yes. <laughs> um, so out of Tobias Merriweather, what would I want to, to see if we are looking at um, some zone? Let me get some things adjusted real quick. What I want to see out of Tobias Merriweather is if they, if they, if they, um, if they determine zone early on and they, they kind of get into a more of a zone route, I think ultimately what would benefit someone like Tobias Merriweather, knowing he has speed inside size is literally getting into a fade route down the sideline. And essentially what Sam Hartman has to do um, is place that ball, you know, just over top of the corner um, and just underneath the safety. And I think with, again, with Tobias's speed, um, and size, that shouldn't be hard. He should be able to get past the corner um, and then use his size to ultimately kind of seal off the safety and, and have Sam Hartman drop that ball, you know, basically right in the bread basket there. So that's a lot of what I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm expecting, you know, out of, out of the zone stuff is fades, a lot of fades down the sideline. Um, another route that you could get into, um, depending on, you know, route concept, is again some more of these maybe deeper kind of post routes, right? You're trying to work over the top of the corner, and again, you know the safety is going to be bailing out. So again, you kind of have to drop the ball in between both of them there, knowing that Tobias again is going to be able to use his speed to get past the first level, and then use his body and size to seal off the second level. So that's what I'd like to see out of Tobias. Um, and a lot of the zone routes and then getting into some of these, you know, when we notice man to man concepts, you're going to notice that. Ooh, let me go <laughs> back to 2D. Um, what you're going to notice out of that is, you know, these DBs are going to be pressed up a little bit more. Maybe this linebacker gets pressed up a little bit more. And because of that, this safety might help out just a little bit more down. Oh, you know, be more of a, a center fielder, I guess you should say, uh, in, in terms of man concepts. But 
what I like out of if you want to go against uh, Tobias Merriweather in um, in a man concept, I think that bodes well for him too because that's when when you're in man concepts, that's where the the art of route running comes into play. You have to be able to run routes way more concisely in man coverage. Um, so in this case, again, a, a typical man beater is running some sort of quick slant, you know, in or out, depending on what you want, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. And that can be ran at five yards. That can be ran at seven yards. And really that can be ran at 10 yards too. You know, there's no, just because it's a slant doesn't mean it has to be run immediately. Right. And so I think that is a, a, a quick hitter where you're looking at third and short, you know, maybe second and short, and you notice that they're pressed up on you. Why not, why not use Merriweather's size and just allow him to get in front of these, you know, smaller DBs and just put the ball right on his chest. I think that's a lot of what you're going to see um, out of man. And you're going to see this tight end kind of flood the concept, right? He's going to, he's going to get everyone kind of moving out of Merriweather's, I guess, general area and allow him to really work um, one on one. So to me, that's what I want to see out of Tobias. And I think that either way, he's got the makeup to beat both man and zone at a high rate. I agree. And I think a lot of people agree with you as well. Good stuff with the whiteboard. It's been absent for a little bit. Good to have it back. Appreciate it. I do what I can around here. I'm going to go ahead and throw this crying belly question in here. He says, if you're Steve Angeli passed up by Minchie on the depth chart, what's stopping you from entering the portal midseason and leaving the QB room in a bad position depth wise. I mean, there's nothing stopping him. The, you know, the only question is, does he feel at least some kind of commitment to the team that he wouldn't make a move like that midseason? Obviously, you had that a few years back at Clemson when Kelly Bryant got passed up by Trevor Lawrence. You know, it happens. And, you know, it it's you know, we've said it before, as Notre Dame continues to raise its raise the bar with its recruiting the quarterback position, you're going to have guys who are probably going to have to make some decisions to leave at some point. You obviously hope that they don't happen midseason, but they still could happen midseason. So there's 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 nothing to stop him other than whether or not he at least feels committed to the team. And if he's not playing, it's not like he's going to go play for somebody else midseason right away. He might transfer someplace, but you know, he's not going to be able to play until the following season anyway. Uh, my overall answer to that question is Angeli will complete his degree and then make whatever decision is best for him um, at that time. I think his, his number one priority you know, where he's been at on the depth chart now and how far he's gotten into his degree. I think that is going to be, you know, the, the number one thing that he's going to focus on. Listen, I got to a point when I was playing and I knew I wanted to go on to graduate school and football really wasn't, you know, it was getting to the end of the road, right? I was playing in the NEIA and it was just time to kind of focus on, you know, what's going to take you further uh, in your career. And so I think Angeli will be focused on something like his degree. And then if he is fortunate enough to finish that and have a little bit of eligibility left over, I think he might go on and have some fun at a, at a smaller school and, and maybe get that opportunity to be, you know, a starter before it's all said and done. Yeah. And no, he has not completed his degree. He is only a sophomore right now. So, you know, that is, that is, uh, you know, still a ways away, even if he's at a, uh, an accelerated pace and, you know, again, no, he could. It's not like he could go join somebody right away. The portal is not open midseason. So he could leave the team and lead the, the school. But again, kind of like I was just saying, it's not going to do him any good because you, you can't start actually transferring someplace until December rolls around. That's when the window opens to actually go someplace, just like with Drew Pine last year. So it's not like you could actually, you know, pack up and go join a team like a you know, another team like a free agent in the middle of the season. So it would do no good at that point. Jesse, Vince and I spent some time this week talking about the movie Rudy. And I had some people ask what you think of the movie Rudy. So take it away. I guess uh, my opinion is highly sought after. Whoa, hang on. I'm going through some some technical difficulties. Yeah, now you're orange. Now you're oh, now you're blue. At the moment, give me one second here. Kind of pink. 
There we go. There you go. Um, I am – I'm not high on Rudy, to be honest with you. I think it's an inaccurate, overblown depiction. Oh, of, coming in strong. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> I think it's a great feel-good story, and I think it's like it gives every kind of um, you know it it, it it basically is like it, no matter your size or you know ability, there's still there's still a chance for you. And I just I don't think that that's very realistic because even to get a you know a, a, an opportunity as like a walk-on or, you know, some, uh, some schools hold the walk-on tryouts. I, it's just very unrealistic. Like he, it, he needed to be more of a, like he just didn't have the intangibles to even be a guy who should be considered as a walk-on, right? Like he was this small, unathletic kind of white guy who couldn't do a whole lot. And so to me, it, again, it's overblown. I've only seen it a couple of times because again, it's not like it's this, some great movie. Um, so yeah, it's do I do I would I recommend it to someone? Sure, I'd recommend it to someone who hasn't seen it before. But again, I, I think it gives false hope to uh, to people who really don't have too much of a chance. In my good opinion. underdog story, you know, like I said and like I've said before, I think they lay it on a little bit thick with the oh the kids got heart and you know if you had the heart of Rudy and they they lay it on very thick. Nine references in the last forty five minutes to Rudy's heart it's a little bit much you know and to uh you know to your point about what you were just talking about uh, we didn't mention this the other you know like exactly what you're talking about the guy who was the notre dame legacy you know the other walk on you know in the in the movie he never got to play so like even though he you know had this notre dame connection and you know he was there had scholarship offers could have played someplace else and all this stuff he didn't but you know rudy gets built up because of the fact that he got his handful of plays in one game at the end of the georgia tech game but you know look again good underdog story it's notre dame it holds up over time and all that stuff but i definitely there's some stuff that's a little bit too much for me it's exaggerated yes exactly it's a hollywood movie it's exaggerated that's right. Let me ask you this. If someone was going to make one new 30 for 30, you could only make one new 30 for 30 or docuseries that's Notre Dame related. Would you rather see one that is the real story of Rudy or something else? You know, so like, you know, like we're talking about how things were fabricated. You know, like they didn't talk about the fact that he was actually in the Navy and you know, like the Jersey scene didn't happen. And Dan Devine wasn't this antagonist. He was actually pro Rudy. Would you like to see something that sort of sets the record straight about Rudy? Or would you rather see a Notre Dame, you know, documentary type 30 for 30 about something else? Yeah, um, I, I let's see. If, if Rudy wasn't Rudy and they introduced the concept of Rudy, I think I'd be more on board for it as a 30 for 30 now. But knowing, you know, what Rudy is and everything around it, I'm done with it. I don't need another 30 for 30 on Rudy. Um, I would want to see it, you know, something else. So my question, counter question for you would be if Notre Dame did do a 30 for 30 on any sport, any topic at Notre Dame, what would you want your 30 for 30 documentary to be about? I've been thinking about this and I would actually like I think that it would be interest like one, like the whole Jerry Faust scenario would be one that that I think would be interesting but you know that that's going to skew to the negative you know like a high school coach from Cincinnati much like Rudy loved Notre Dame wanted to come to Notre Dame got his chance to coach Notre Dame it didn't work out but it you know on the heels of that came one of the most successful spans in Notre Dame history as well Tim Brown becomes a Heisman Trophy winner Lou Holtz leads Notre Dame to a national championship and within striking distance of a couple other national championships there in the early 90s. So I would like to see one sort of like the fall and rise of Notre Dame in the 80s, starting with the Jerry Faust era and into the Lou Holtz era and how it was, you know, built back up and, and all of those iconic players who came out of that Lou Holtz era. And even, you know, from from the Faust era as well, because there were some good players from the Faust era. They just didn't have a lot of 
success at Notre Dame. So that's that's what I would like to see something on that that 1980s Fausta Holtz era at Notre Dame. Yeah, so I would have two. Option one would be li- quite literally the Lou Holtz era at Notre Dame. Uh, you know, going like uh, basically what you were talking about, you know, when he entered the program and the rise of, you know, Notre Dame football as we saw it in the 80s and 90s because of Lou Holtz. Um, and then my next option would be just a, a good old 30 for 30 on Rocket Ishmael and his time at Notre Dame. I think those would be uh, the, the two that I'd want to go with because I think that Rocket is – one of the most exciting players of all time at Notre Dame. I didn't necessarily get to see it live. And so I would like to see, you know, actual historic footage and just, uh, you know, interviews, him talking about his time at Notre Dame. I think that would be something that would be really interesting. And then obviously, you know, the clipping call, that would be a big, you know, mm-hmm. proponent in the, in the docuseries. So yeah. Michigan I, I thinking to him twice. Yeah. The whole, yeah. I dig that. And, and I mean, you know, the 30 for 30s specifically have done a lot of different episodes on individual athletes. I think Rocket would be a great one to do. The fact that he got robbed of a Heisman Trophy, you know, by a quarterback from, you know, a whack school that, that threw like a million interceptions that year. You know, like I <laughs> I think that that would be interesting to uh, to talk about as well. I, I think a Rocket would be very interesting. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Somebody needs to get on that. I don't know. I don't know why they haven't already. <laughs> D Troll Hunter is trolling us right now. <laughs> yeah, he said that uh, that he is going to hold this. He said, "I forgive you guys for this, but I want to know I hold it against you in the future." Talking about our Rudy take, um, and then someone said that basically we have impaired minds because we're cowboy fans, and he said, well, "I'm a Cowboys <laughs> fan as well." So. I liked Rudy when it first came out, but again, I think I think the max on that movie is like four to five viewings. That's what that, I mean. It's just, yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge like rewatch of a movie. You are. You watch a great movie fifty times and act like you've never seen it before. But you know, I can only watch a movie so many times, and Rudy is not up there for a movie that I'm going to watch multiple times. Yep, I concur. So, James, another question from the mailbag tonight. What do you foresee with CJ Carr in the 24 campaign? Does he plan to enroll early? Will he maintain his red shirt while playing the minimum of four games? I think he enrolls early, but I don't think he gets any playing time in that first year. Yeah. Like we've talked, we've talked about this, you know, really over the last few weeks about what's going to happen in 24 at the quarterback position. I still think they're going to go out and go to the transfer portal. Now, some of that's going to be determined by who's available in the portal, like what kind of quarterback you can get. Some of it's going to be determined on what they see from Angeli and Minchie this season. Um, I just. Okay. Counter to that. Do you think if the wide receivers have a really productive year that makes them more confident in uh, younger quarterbacks because they can kind of carry along a younger quarterback potentially? And if the wide receivers have more of a down year, do you think you need someone – not a down year, but not as you know great. Do you think you need an, an experienced quarterback to kind of compensate for something like that? I just think either way they're they're going to go out. And the schedule is is pretty conducive next year. Now they're going to start off on the road. you know, So that's going to be – you know, just like last year at Ohio State, they're going to Texas A&M to start the season next year. So do you want a guy who's potentially making – you know, like a, a whether it's any of these guys, assuming they they don't get any real extensive playing time this year, do you want one of those guys going down to Texas A and M, making their first start? You know, in a game that's essentially right off the bat, I think going to have college football playoff implications because it's also going to be easier to get to the playoff next year, but you can't afford to go on the road and lay an egg right away against Texas A and M. So that's why I think, you know, you probably want someone with some experience coming in would have been a lot better off having someone with experience last year just like two years ago when you got jack cone so yeah um so yeah i think he i think he like you said i think he enrolls early um i think he maintains his red shirt by playing in a maximum it would actually be a maximum of four games not a minimum but i think that that's kind of the way that it ends up 
DJ says he th thinks Minchie starts in 24 and they may go to the portal for a QB room. You know, again, like I, I know a lot of people talk about they're going winning. to the portal. They need some sort of overall experience. Both right. those guys are going to have zero experience. And I just don't think, you know, there's got to be a safety blanket. Like if you go to the portal, you're not going to, I just don't think you're bringing in someone who's got a, a 50 50 chance of winning a starting job because that guy, if he's got, a year of remaining eligibility. He doesn't want to come to Notre Dame and potentially sit on the bench. You know, he wants to come in and, and be able to start. That's, that's why he'd come to a place like Notre Dame. So I don't think you're going to add a guy just for some depth next year. If you're bringing a quarterback in out of the portal, that's like dream, dream <laughs> scenario. I think I Tyler wish Buckner. dream scenario is Tyler Buckner never left. Saw some playing time this year, really developed under Sam Hartman and really took the reins the year after that. But yeah, I get it. You know, he's a top talent and he wants to play now and he can't you can't squander the window. So. Yep. Fill in the blank. The MLB all star game uniforms were blank. So I got to put this into two categories and I'll, I'll yes. fill in the blank for both. The MLB all star uniforms were pretty. The MLB. NL jerseys were hideous. I hate when teams go just because, you know, like like the, the AL did those nice teal with some white pants. There was nice color. It felt like summertime. You know, I was all cool with those. But I don't understand why they always get it half right and half wrong. Just because, you know, you're not wearing the white, the whites, you know, as, as the, uh, the home team. I don't understand why the NL has to go with that such dark, harsh, like black and navy type scheme. Like that's just so ugly. Like you can still it do was. vibrant stuff just because the dark you're on the, dark, especially. That's what like I mean. Saying. Like, why are was, you going dark on dark? You don't have like to a, do that. That was like a travel ball uniform. You know? That's what I mean. <laughs> they always do that though. They always make one of them look really nice and they always go dark on dark for the other ones. And it's like you don't have to do that. You're like, who? in what world is navy, blue, and black going well together in a summertime all-star game? I just don't get it. I've got a solution. And I know, you know, they think they're going to sell merchandise. And, like, you're, you know, you're still in your 20s. So you're the guy that they're supposed to be trying to market this whole thing. To, I love you know, the like, hats. The hats were great. Hats, hats were good. I like the hats. I don't understand why they, you know, again – I understand why, because they think they're going to sell more merchandise. I don't know how many jerseys and stuff like that they were going to sell with those ugly uniforms last night, but that's the reason you do it. But like, you know, everyone, it, it, it's cool if everyone wears the same hat, but let them wear their real uniform yeah, you know, from their team like, like they too. used to. I think it looks cool when they're, you know, like you still, you know, everyone wears white or everyone wears gray or whatever, but it's from your actual team. That's what's cool about the all-star game is you actually can identify, you know, what team everybody's from. And it, you know, it, it makes it a little bit harder. Like when you're watching the game and you're trying to, what team, what exactly team is he from? You know, cause again, everyone's yeah, got the same the only, hat. The when same when they're batting, the only way I would know what team they're from is they only, they had the logo on their, their hip on their pants. I don't know if you right. saw that. That's the only reason. I mean, getting into the, the batting, too, I thought the helmets were ugly, too. They were just these awkward A and L or A and N's on the helmets. Like I literally on. kept thinking, like, the National League guys were from Northwestern or something. <laughs> that big N and the black that they had. It's like, it was just yeah. so bad. And they have people who are dedicated solely to do this. And it's like, that's really what you came up with? That's what you thought would be the most appealing? I, I don't know. I could do a better job than that. I concur. I concur. So James with a follow-up about the quarterbacks. Are we going to the portal every year now? Honest question. I think they're going to go to the portal. And we talked about this, I think, like a couple of weeks ago or like a week and a half, two weeks ago in terms of what quarterback development would look like in terms, you know, in the, in the next four years or so. I think what's happening right now is you're kind of stripping away or relaying the foundation. And I don't think you want to go to the portal every year, but I think you kind of have to out, as an, out of a need right now because of what you inherited – from the past regime um, and, and the lack of development of quarterback. And so until you can internally develop your own quarterbacks and get a conveyor belt going of, you know, producing quarterback year after year, you're going to have to go to the portal because you have no time to waste at Notre Dame. You can't just 
put in a freshman quarterback and hope things go well because then everyone's going to be crying that they're going six and six. But that's what's going to happen if you if you roll out a CJ Carr or Kenny Menchie. You got to have someone in there that is a proven winner. And until you can you know start that conveyor belt of the quarterback development, which I think Marcus Freeman is going to do, he just can't do it in a, at the snap of a finger, right? Like it takes time. And so I think until he gets that rhythm in, in motion, he's got to go to the portal. I agree. And, you know, I said last year, I didn't think it was the worst idea last year not to go to the portal. But then the worst case scenario happens. Tyler Buckner gets injured because at least Buckner had some game experience from the year before when Jack Cohn was here, even if it was as a package guy, you know. They wouldn't need to go, as you said before, they wouldn't need to go potentially to the portal again next year if Tyler Buckner had stuck around. The quarter, you know, the quarterback room would look a lot different. It's crazy because like when you when I think we were walking out of spring practice and one of the guys on the beat said, you know, well, we'll never see those three quarterbacks together again. And I didn't necessarily think that it was going to be Tyler Buckner who was going to bolt. The way he did. And there goes Tyler Buckner. Now the whole quarterback room looks a lot different. It's you're exactly right. Like you've got to get that kind of uh, succession plan in place. And I didn't think that it was the worst decision not to go with a transfer last year, but because of the way things ended up last year and the opportunity to go out and get the most literally the most experienced quarterback in college football history because he's going to be playing in his sixth year now to go and be able to get that with everything that he's done i think that that was an opportunity that was too good to pass up for Notre Dame and now you're hoping that he can mentor these guys and maybe by the end of the season they have a better feel for Kenny Minchie and whether or not he's going to be ready next year you, you know you want to have competition but I, I just think that there's a very strong case that they will be able or you know, know that it, they will me, go back to the portal again. To me, it's a really because it really honestly feels like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, right? Like, if say you don't go to the portal and you trust your young quarterbacks, and then for whatever reason your young quarterback gets hurt, aka Tyler Buckner last year, well, why didn't you have someone ready? Why didn't you have someone who could step in and take the charge? And then it's oh, you went out into the portal and got yourself a security blanket. Why are you trusting him and not, you know, focusing on developing your own homegrown quarterbacks? I just think it's, again, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And I, I honestly have no problems with what they're doing. Um, and, yeah, I'll go back to basically what I was just saying. I, I, I really think that they're going to the portal as a necessity, but they will, over the years, start to develop their own kind of system of quarterback development. But until that happens, you're going to have to go to the portal. Yeah. Back to the All-Star game. Nate Valdi wore an earpiece and talked to Joe Davis and John Smoltz in the broadcast booth while he was pitching last night. What would you think of that move? I'm not here for it. Um, and to me, <laughs> there were multiple conversations with the pitchers, and it just felt like uh, uh, the, 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 the pitchers, like on the back of their mind, just wanted to be like, leave me alone. Just let me pitch. I'm in an All-Star game, right? Like, but Why he agreed we to wear it. it. He agreed to wear the piece and he agreed to talk to yeah, him. Yeah, but no one's know? gonna say no, right? Like it's the all-star game. And if someone comes up to you and they say, Hey, like we really want you to put the earpiece in and we're just gonna chit chat with you for a little bit, like no one's gonna say no. But to me, at the end of the day, it's just like it felt like the overall vibe was just like, leave me alone. Why are we doing this? Like, I'm only here because you know, you guys want me to be here. I, I don't know. It just felt like a little bit too much for me, right? Like just I, it's one thing to talk to the position players, but I don't need to, you know, be talking to the pitcher as he's going into the windup and, you know, you know, all the, it's just, it's too much for the pitchers. I can, I don't mind it for the outfielders who are predominantly just standing out there hoping something comes to them. But when we're talking about a pitcher, the guy who's got to, you know, literally pitch at every pitch, you know, I, it's just too much for me, too much. Yeah, I was really surprised, you know, because like you said, it's one thing for a position player to do. I was shocked that a pitcher would agree to do it, but Evaldi was out there. It's like he I think they asked him one question and he gives up a single and he's like, oof. And then, he, you know, he gives up another <laughs> single. And it's like he's it didn't seem very happy. That's what I mean. It, he's trying to focus. This is the all star game. This is like right. the pinnacle of his career. The last well, thing he needs to be time, focused it's on the -Star game. It's is like answering the John series. Smoltz's question about, you know, well, you know, whatever he's got to ask. I right. thought it was really cool when they did that segment 
where Ortiz, A-Rod, and Jeter were all sitting behind the on-deck circle. I thought that was really cool. (laughs) Yeah, I thought that was enjoyable. That was. That was one of the more enjoyable. Like, after the first inning, when the two outfielders, Garcia and um, uh, the left fielder, the Tampa Bay Rays, um, Randy uh, Rosarena, Rosarena, when they made the two defensive plays, in the first inning, like that was the most excitement there for a long time. And then they, you know, they, they, they went to that little trio and, and that, that, that was pretty fun after Ortiz got over the weather cast that he started things off with. So, but I was, I was definitely surprised that Evaldi agreed to do something like that as a pitcher, but he kind of, he like walked him through that, that strikeout that he had uh, later in the inning. And that was, that was kind of cool talking about, you know, he was talking about what pitch he was going to throw and, and all that kind of stuff, but again, shocked that they would that uh, that a pitcher would do it. Fill in the blank. ESPN's broadcast of the home run derby was blank. ESPN's broadcast of the home run derby was lackluster. They dropped the ball. I got sick of hearing launch angle and exit velo and da 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 da. da. Just give me the Chris Berman back 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 gone. You know what I mean, like. It's their home run derby. I don't care how they hit it. It's the whole point of the the the, 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 the freaking derby, right? They're just there to hit bombs. Everyone's going to do it a different way. Maybe you're freaking dipping your shoulder back and trying to launch everything. Maybe you're trying to stay on top of it a little bit more. But it was just too much, you know? Like, it's just over analytical. Just let these guys hit home runs and have fun with it because that's what it's supposed to be. And I, I just felt like they, they took some of the fun out of it and tried to just be so wow. analytical about – you know, the swing path and exit velo and launch angle. And it's just, just too much, you know? And you didn't, you didn't really get to see any of the home runs, you know, like they did a straight split screen of the hitter and the outfield. And you didn't get to like, you know, it's like with this format that they've gone to over the last few years, you don't actually get to see how far any of these balls are, are, are going. You know, I, I would much rather see just like a small insert of the batter and then actually, you know, like a bigger, you know, wide screen of the outfield to actually see where the ball is going. Because yeah, then they like hit most, it, and then you just see like a scat pass it. of where yeah. it was going. You couldn't even see if it was yeah, what it what it was doing or or that it had gone out, you know. And so that was I thought I thought the most the the best part of the night. The two things were Julio Rodriguez with his forty one home runs. You know, the, the hometown guy just out. <laughs> setting a record, and then Adley Rushman after. He hit 20 oh, that was from, tremendous. Hit 20 from the left side. He gets his little break. And then in 30 seconds, he hits seven more home runs from the right side. He's the first guy ever in the history of the home run derby to switch hit during the home run derby. So that was that was a pretty cool moment. And unfortunately, he ended up getting be- beat by Luis Robert, um, you know, in that first round. But do you want to hear something fun funny? Sure. Um, I filled out a home run bracket and it was like a national competition. Um, and I think I can't remember, you know, like if you got it right, it puts you into a pool that could potentially win, whatever. I got the entire thing, right? I just didn't hit submit. <laughs> oh, I got man. every matchup right down to the winner. Everything. Really? I got all of them correct. And Luckily, I still bet on Vladdy Jr. to win the whole thing, so I made a couple bucks off of that on FanDuel. Um, but yeah, I, I filled out and not not. I mean, I'm no like I just I was just looking at it and I was like, ah, this kind of feels right. And then I took a screenshot of it and then I realized I never hit submit. So oh man, that was super brutal. fun. <laughs> That's brutal. All right, well, a lot of good talk, a lot of good quarterback talk, and everything else. We got Jesse's true opinion on Rudy. Tonight, so we got that. John Christophic, I missed this one earlier. He says the program is the best sports movie. What do you have? You seen the program before? Uh, I don't know. Big program fan. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I have. I might have seen it once. It's been a long time since I've seen the program. I might have to see if I can find it and watch it again sometime. All right. Well, Henry is barking us out. So. <laughs> We'll said, wrap up on that. It is time to wrap it up. You did. All right, Jess, I will talk to you tomorrow. Got a lot coming up again on tomorrow's show. Thanks for all the great questions tonight. We had a lot of good ones tonight. We started slow, but finished strong. So that's what's 
important. So uh, we will talk to you tomorrow. Hit the like button on your way out. And of course, subscribe, rate, and review. We'll talk to you mañana on IB Nation Sports Talk.